When we began this project, it was really quite daunting to walk into a space like this and just see thousands of objects that would all require moving. The sheer scale of it was really quite overpowering. This is a barn, it's a storeroom. It's, it's like every barn you could imagine on some farm full of abandoned material from over the years. All the everyday minutiae, it's, it's those little bits and pieces that tell us so much about daily life. It's this sort of constantly unravelling story, which is I think the, sort of the great delight of actually working on this project. The wool shed at Rouse Hill is thought to have been built in the late 1850s by Edwin Rouse, who was the estate's second owner. Why it's called the wool shed comes from one of the oral histories here. Gerald Terry, who was the estate's last permanent resident, remembers that his grandfather, Edwin Stephen Rouse, remembers that as a boy he'd seen wool coming in here from some of the other properties being sorted and repacked, and it acquired the name wool shed from that point on. It seems though it was more of a generic barn structure from that period. We don't think they ever actually ran sheep here for wool at Rouse Hill, but we do know that they ran uh, quite large flocks for mutton, uh, both for sale and for use on the estate itself. The project of the wool shed is one of the capital maintenance projects for this financial year. The project consists on stabilising it as its structure has partially sunken and tilted. When we started managing this property, there were other uh, buildings like the slaughterhouse that were actually collapsed in, in situ. That was not the case for the wool shed. And we've been able to do these repairs before there is any danger of collapsing. Structures like these, of course, were not designed to last 150, let alone 200 years. And now we're at this position where a lot of remediation work and conservation work actually needs to be done. The catch for us is that we need to access, in many cases, the base of the large posts in the centre of the building. That means we need to raise the floorboards, but it also means we need to raise thousands of objects and actually remove them from the structure. Up until now, there hasn't really been much focus on the wool shed. It was seen very much as off limits and a place that you looked from a distance but you didn't get in and really engage with. And over a number of years we've started to really look a little bit further at that. This was an operating farm and it's really important and a really rich story that's held within the wool shed. The significance of Rouse Hill is that from the time it was first granted to Richard Rouse by Governor Lachlan Macquarie until 1978 when it was acquired by the New South Wales State Government, it had been one family that had lived here continuously for six generations. And as a result, everywhere we look on the estate, whether it be inside the rooms of the house or in the landscape, we see evidence of every generation that has lived here. In the case of the wool shed, it might be bits of furniture, it might be timber boxes, it could be machinery and engines from the mid 20th century. It could be a table that we can date back to the 1830s. It could be a box of light globes from the 1950s, but there's this wonderful layering that we find and it tells this story of continual occupation over many, many years. So the first time you walk into the wool shed, you don't really see what's there because there's so much material and it was covered in so much dust and leaves that everything is pretty monotone, pretty much the one colour and you just get hit with this sense of stuff and it runs from one end of the shed to the other and it's all things that have just ended up in those positions over, over time. This building is not sealed to the elements. As the, the timber slabs have dried over the years, large cracks have opened up as the building has settled as well. Rouse Hill is extremely dusty and it has a very, very fine clay dust that blows in. So every time we get a wind, every object in here gets coated in this dust. So what we're really doing now is also removing decades and decades worth of this dust from the objects. One of the many challenges of working in here, of course, is that the objects, though they may look sturdy, could actually be quite fragile. And the handling that we give them can be quite complex. We've had a ladder that was probably around 20 feet long. It took four of us to actually lift off and bring it down and actually take it out of the structure. The challenge there was that wrapped around it was an old section of electrical cord. It had become extremely brittle as the plastic and the rubber coating around that had started to denature 
with time. So we had to actually be extremely careful and quite painstaking in unraveling that cord. And that's one of the challenges we're facing right through this structure. Um, linoleum, for instance, with age, may actually get very, very brittle and crack when we try and move it. So object handling is a really major consideration in a project like this. So the process that we've used involves us working quadrant by quadrant through the site. That way we've got a bit more control because we need to know where things go back at the end of this. Larger objects like tables, benches, pieces of machinery, fuel drums for instance, we're triangulating. So we're taking the distances from the major structural elements so they can be put back into the same place. At the heart of the wool shed is a fantastic static engine. It's a Ruston and Hornsby engine and we've got all the original labelling and things. It's a fantastic object that ran most of the machinery within the shed, including a small generator at the back of it. It's got an overhead drive shaft over the top of it, into which all the other pieces of machinery could hook up, and you'll see those great big leather straps that allowed them to run. It's my favourite object in the place. One of the long-term aims with this project is to allow more access for people. We know there's a lot of people who have a really passionate interest in farm machinery and these sorts of operations, and we'd really love to share that more with people. So what we'd like to see as we move forward is that we set it up in a way where people can actually move a bit more safely through the space and in small groups see and stand in that area and really feel what it felt like to be in one of these men's sheds. Um, it, it is a building that I have a bit of attachment to. It's a very unique building and it forms part of the rural landscape of this property and I think that's extremely important. Because we do constant maintenance and constant um, termite inspections, uh, we don't have any active cases of, of uh, white ant. Um, however, we did do an analysis on the um, collection and on the building and we did find borer. Spora is, is the sort of insect that will bore into and drop eggs way inside the timber of an object or a building. That might stay there for a few years and eventually the borers hatch out, eat through the timber and come out as a flying insect, which means they can not only infest themselves through the wool shed and the collection there, but they have the potential to fly onto other buildings on the site, such as the stables or the house. When the project is completed, the building itself is going to be treated for borers and other pests that might affect the structure. For the collection, uh, for any organic material, so that's timbers, wood, leather, fabrics, for instance, all of that is being frozen. So after uh, the cleaning process, everything is sealed inside bags, and then we have a very large uh, 40 foot long deep freeze on site. It's set to minus 20 degrees, and all the material is placed in there for a minimum of one week. That guarantees that any residual pests that might actually be inside those collection items will be killed before they're actually reinstated into the building. There are some items that are pure metal. They don't need to go into the freezer, they can go straight into a shipping container. Other things will have various components. They might have timber in them, they might have rubber tubing. Today we're looking at mattresses that have kapok, which is a type of coconut fibre in them. Um, so obviously we have to think of each thing. There are some things that can't go in the freezer, glass being the most important one we have to keep an eye out for. It will just shatter if it goes through the freezer. Okay, so here we are in one of two shipping containers. And over here we're standing in the regular shipping container. It's not frozen. It's mostly metal objects in here, but a variety of things that won't get those pests in it. Um, this container generally has a lot of the really heavy objects. <laughs> so this is an example of one of the things we have on the heavy shelves. Um, and I just like the sheer scale of some of the things that are coming out of here. It's a huge block and tackle a huge hook. I don't know what it was used for. I don't know what you'd be lifting with something like this. Um, it's definitely why we need some of the heavy duty shelves in here. Uh, we have mystery objects in here. As we've been finding objects in the wool shed and bringing them out, we haven't known what they are. Progressively as it went on through the 20th century and as these rooms were used less and less, they started to get used as storage. And so a lot of material that would otherwise be discarded ended up in here. And that's the real importance of what we're looking at, is that all that little detail that tells us so much, and informs us so much about life here, actually survives in these spaces.
there's probably four and a half thousand objects in here in these various rooms all together. About 450 of those are accessioned. Uh, and also part of our challenge of this early stage of the project is to get a lot more information about that material, to try and gather extra information about materials, possible uses, and to tie those objects into the wider story of life here at the estate. I think one of my favourites has been um, a telescopic bed, so like a stretcher bed used for camping. We were able to actually extend that for the cleaning process, and we realised that it's probably the same telescopic bed that was used by a man named Arthur Sherwood. He and his family lived in the cottage after the Dixons. He didn't go to war to World War I because he'd broken his leg, and while he was recovering from that, he slept in a telescopic bed on the veranda of the cottage, and we think this is the very one that he used. So one of the really interesting things we've recovered recently out of the wool shed is a very large chainsaw. It had been buried for many years under the Bougainvillea, and when we pulled it out, even our strong guys felt it was really a bit too heavy to climb up a tree and chop down timber. And we had a look, it's got two lugs, one on either side, which would allow it to be used in a more static position. And knowing that we had this large conveyor belt down there, we started thinking about, well, was this in fact used on the property as part of the small wood chopping business that they ran at one stage? So it was really great finding the chainsaw because it's yet another one of those objects that just builds on our understanding of this property and how the farming aspects of it have happened. Because we've had a lot of look in the past in the house, but now we're really bringing ourselves out of the house, looking in the wool shed and really understanding some of the industries that have gone on over the years in this place. So this is one of the mystery objects that are coming out. At first you pick this up and you don't know what it is. And then you have a little bit of a closer look and you get some clues. We've got the um, brass here that's tarnished and it's uh, sort of gone green. It's got this giant cleat here, which is probably for holding some sort of a rope, maybe a metal rope or a um, sizable rope or something like that. And then you see that it's got the chain here, which I'm assuming as you're pulling that chain, you're either pulling this in or out. So you're either clamping down on something or you're pulling it out to tension it. Cleaning the wool shed is a little bit like a marathon because it's an endurance task. You get to a point in the middle where you can't really see where you started. You can't quite see the end yet. So the only thing you can do is keep going. I've been cleaning objects for over eight weeks now. It's pretty labor intensive work. It takes a long time. Um, a lot of these are being cleaned with paint brushes and vacuum cleaners where we, we're gently brushing and brushing the dust off individually. We're emptying containers, cleaning the contents as best we can. So everything's going to go back in in a lot better condition than it came out. It's a big job, but again, like a marathon, it's really rewarding when you get to the end. So I'm looking forward to getting to the end and getting the wool shed clear so that the other work on the building can start. One thing I'm particularly looking forward to will be at the end of this first stage of the project, when for the first time since this structure was actually built in the 1850s, we're going to see these rooms empty and understand them as they were first constructed. For me as a curator, what's really important about this project is not just that we're conserving a very significant building on the estate, one that helps us to really understand the pastoral and the agricultural life of Rouse Hill, but that this deep understanding that we're getting of life, everyday life, from the objects that we're taking out here, how this helps to give us a far more informed, more nuanced understanding of the life, not just of the Rouse and the Terry families, but of the people who lived and worked on this estate as well.